Welcome to the Man of Mastery podcast. I want to thank you and once again say I appreciate you. And now more than ever, I really hope everybody is healthy and staying safe in this in this crisis. Now, today's guest, episode 49 with Dan Stanchfield, Tracker Dan. Dan recently said that a crisis is a great opportunity to test plans and find gaps and find ways for improvement. And Dan is somebody that I've really wanted to get on the show for a while. I'm super excited about the wealth of knowledge and the wealth of experience he has from growing up and running around the outdoors to formal training in wilderness survival, off-grid, backcountry, and then his extensive military service. And he's taken all of that into coaching and training that he does now into a very high-demand, popular knife-making business. And maybe most interesting to me is he's also very, very well versed and studied and really keeps in tune to health trends and longevity and really taking care of himself. So now more than ever, this is so topical to have on. The The only thing I would say is, well, I thank Dan for all the time he put into this one. We could have gone twice as long, three times as long. Uh, so there's a bunch we covered it's I've never had a show highlights this list this long, but as much as we were able to share in a relatively short amount of time today, make sure you do, if you don't already, follow Dan on Instagram and check in and stay in tune with him there because he's constantly sharing knowledge, sharing new things there. And I will get you links to all that in the show notes for this one at manofmastery.com slash 049. Uh, about the situation at hand, the pandemic, some of us may have more time and flexibility than ever before, but what we all do have right here is an opportunity to to reset, to reprioritize, think about shedding what's not working, and really emphasizing and spending more focus on what is and what is important and what is a priority. So I want to remind you that I just created something called Performance Kickstart. It is a training course that's kicking off on April 24th. It's the first of its kind that I've offered to anybody publicly where I'm going to take everything that I've learned over the year since we launched the Man of Mastery brand and podcast and and really over the last intensely four or five years of going out and studying and applying and trying and then wanting to share this stuff. So it's a way to get a small group of guys together take immediate action and kickstart some of the changes that maybe you've been wanting to make or really get that push to ratchet up to to the next level. This is seven weeks, seven or eight weeks of weekly live sessions remotely over Zoom. It is challenges. It is homework. It is accountability. And I would say, once again, my warning would be, along with the invitation, is that simple and easy are two different things. So this is, you know, if if you're looking to really up that potential and show up and perform every single day, then go check out more about this at manofmastery.com slash kickstart. Check it out and let me know if you have any questions. Again, April 24th, this all kicks off for a two-month run. Okay, and so just a couple more quick things before we do jump in with Tracker Dan. I I just want to talk a little bit about the title that I gave this episode. You know, I try to come up with something catchy or just something fitting with with each guest and with each episode. I thought about calling this one something very, you know, Darwin-like, survival of the fittest. Or, I don't know, I was thinking fear and loathing. You know, we've got this fear perpetuating our our circumstances right now. And I don't know why Dan somehow reminds me a little bit of, of, of Hunter Thompson, who I think a lot of as, as an author, I'm a huge fan. Maybe it's the, the floppy hat that Dan wears on his videos sometimes. I don't know. But in the end, I decided to go with, I called it Honesty is the First Chapter. And that's part of a, a book, or sorry, a quote by Thomas Jefferson that in full goes, Honesty is the First Chapter in the Book of Wisdom. And as Dan talks about some of his business challenges and the the struggle in striking a balance between uh, carrying on the art of metalworking and knife making compared to a business and a business-focused and profit-driven society and some of the things that happen in that, 
that can break the the trust of business. And, and he talks a bit about the trust that is placed in brotherhood and organizations. So I think you'll understand once you hear it. I decided to pick a theme in terms of honesty. And I love uh, love Thomas Jefferson and, the, and that quote, honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. Seems seems really fitting for for this one with Dan here today. And then last note is if you are listening to this audio only, so the typical Apple Podcasts, iTunes, uh, Android, this, if all goes well, should be the first time I've got a video interview up on YouTube. So especially with some of the things Dan is going to talk about with his knife making and his sheath and his clip, uh, Check, check that out. I would say definitely watch this one on video. That's, that's the way to go. And hey, you get to, get to know the guest and see them and see their personality on, on camera a little bit more as well. Okay, so you can find that one over at, at YouTube. You just have to search for Man of Mastery because the URL is ugly or hit my website or hit manofmastery.com slash 049 and you can link right over there. With that, let's jump right in with Dan Stanchfield. Today, hey Dan, how are you? I got uh, the pleasure and the honor of talking to a uh, very popular figure in, in, in a lot of circles, Tracker Dan, or uh, do we say your full name? I'm, I don't know how that goes. Yeah, Dan Stanchfield, that's fine. Okay, Dan Stanchfield. But yeah, everybody knows me by Tracker Dan. So. Tracker Dan, yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Uh, we've been beginning to catch up for a little while. And yeah, yeah. You've got some incredible experience and knowledge, and it's, uh, it's timely in everyday life, but probably even more timely in the, in the crazy world we find ourselves in at the, at the moment. So, Thanks for uh, spending some time. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Uh, you know what? I did forget to ask before we started rolling, how much time do you have? And I'll just manage us to that. Um, you know, it's schedule's open right now. So, okay. All right. We'll keep, we'll keep it reasonable. <laughs> yeah. No, so, hey, we'll play it by ear. Let's roll with it. I know we could go for a long time with the knowledge you've got. So, we've got a few themes to hit on. Uh, I mean, you are a, uh, a boutique or custom knife maker. You've got uh, tons of experience I want to start off by talking about. You've got uh, a couple other businesses. And uh, you and I both share just a a passion for um, health and and whether that's health in mind, body, spirit, things that are really, really ultimately important right now. So we got some fun stuff to talk about. But do you mind um, sharing a little bit more about your quals and then we can go into your your backstory a bit? Sure. Um, So by quals, do you mean um, just any training in life or the Navy training or... Yeah, maybe just at a high level. I think it's it's uh, it's really interesting to understand when you talk about things like the outdoors. You talk about right, yeah. uh, things like your knife design. How much goes into that? So yeah, if you don't mind, maybe just a, a flyby on on the Navy and Tracker School and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll I'll start off. Uh, you know, from the beginning and go go for it. I'll I'll keep it brief. But uh, basically, when I was you know. Luckily, I had a a father-in-law that got me into archery when I was four years old. And, you know, we were out hunting and shooting all the time and camping and fishing. And when I was six, we moved up to a remote Indian fishing village in British Columbia on, on an inlet sea, you know, and we were there as missionaries to the, the Indians there. And so, you know, from a young age, I'm hauling water from the stream you know, carrying just tons of firewood in my arms as much, you know, and my dad said, if it doesn't hurt, you know, won't make you stronger. (laughs) So, you know, that, that type of life growing up and my mom was part Indian. So she's, you know, we're constantly putting wild edibles on the food, you know, to supplement and we're hunting for our food and fishing for our food. So, um, very close to the earth, um, raising. So, and then, you know, when I was in my teens, we moved back to uh, California and um, I, I ended up uh, st- starting to follow Tom Brown stuff because I was always searching for this knowledge. And um, when I finally, you know, built up the courage to, you know, follow my heart instead of doing what I should be doing, you know, with religion and all that kind of stuff. I went to the tracker school um, at age 26, spent five years um, there, living back in the woods, you know, primitively, um, you know, watching over the place. And then as an instructor and 
meeting lots of people from the military coming through, lots of SEALs. And, you know, my, I always wanted to be a Green Beret growing up and then a SEAL once I learned about them because I just wanted the ultimate test and training um, for becoming the ultimate warrior type thing. And that, um, and my, my dad and the church, they all convinced me to stay away from it. And my dad was in Vietnam and he's talking about how I'd be a robotic killer and all this kind of stuff. And, but seeing all these seals come through the tractor school, you know, that we were training, they were very down to earth, level-headed guys, super humble. And, uh, so, you know, I was, by the time, you know, I, I, I asked one of the guys jokingly, I mean, I was 30 at the time. I was, I was like, could the teams use a guy like me? And I said, yeah, just get an age waiver. Cause I thought I was way too old. And so I, I got in when I was 31, I was the oldest guy in my buds class to make it through. And, uh, then, uh, yeah, just uh, got honor man in, in scout class, um, you know, scout sniper, because uh, all, all of my training um, at tracker school and the Alaska stuff that we did up, up there where, you know, you're going in the water, you know, just your uh, your shorts on for dry suit appreciation <laughs> day. <laughs> um, you know, the instructors were like, looks like you're taking a bath out there, you know, because I was just totally relaxed because I, you know, the tracker school had taught me how to become one with my environment and experience it instead of labeling it as, you know, this is negative, that's negative. You just experience it, you do what you can, but you're not like putting yourself in a negative mind, mindset. So, and, uh, so do, do, I, you mind, do you mind if I jump in with a couple of questions on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty fascinating. So I, I was going to ask, um, I was thinking that was just on, on cold tolerance in particular, but uh, have yeah. you had any exposure to Wim Hof and does that jive I, with what you learned yes. growing up? One of, on the, in the reserves of uh, one of my um, frogman brothers, he, uh, he was telling me all about Wim Hof and I've seen little things here and there, but I, um, I'm definitely going to get the book and, and uh, check it out because it sounds similar to a lot of the stuff Tom Brown talked about because he talked about there's levels of body control where, you know, one's more of a physical um, and it's a buy now, pay later program. And then there's one where you get into certain types of, you know, different alpha states or not alpha, but or, yeah, maybe. And, but it's more like a spiritual thing. Like, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's very interesting stuff. And, um, but the most basic one, you know, is just like, hey, if there was a kid in that water drowning, you would be in there so fast without thinking one bit about the cold, you know, and and your body's going to start pumping and working. But if you're going into it just anticipating fear, your body doesn't support, you know, it doesn't react in a favorable way. So, yeah, no, it's, um, but the one you know, and just a super basic one is just fully immersing yourself in the experience. And kids do that. You see them running around on the beach, just blue as, as, you know, can be, you know, and they're just having fun, you know, and it's like, you're about to die. We better, get, you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, there, one way he would have us do that was this water meditation. And it's just like, you're paying attention to the reflection on the water surface, what's happening on the water surface, what's happening under the water surface. And you keep shifting your awareness between those levels. And when you're going into the water, like you're feeling the water interact with the hair on your legs, you're feeling the sand grind between your toes, like you're feeling everything. You're not like labeling it as bad, you know, or associating it with cold equals bad, you know, kind of thing. So Wow. Okay. So just experiencing it. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I don't, I haven't uh, gone through the Wim Hof training. My understanding is it's a breathing technique to physically generate mm. heat. Okay. Um, I don't know how much of the sort of where you place your attention and how you think of the experience or how you experience the experience. I'm not sure how right. much that gets into. And then yeah. I, I just, just curious. So with, uh, I, I actually was asking somebody a couple of weeks ago, you know, is there something that is uh, sort of unanimously difficult in in the training that, that you guys go through and in, in buds or otherwise and the answer i got from this individual was there are different things that are 
hard for each of us, you know, so yes. everybody's going to kind of find what they're comfortable with, what they're not strong at yep. with your background. Where, you know, where did you find challenges or did you, did you breathe through a lot, a lot of breeze through a lot of the environmental or the physical pieces of it? So yeah, it is going to be different for everyone. And for me, um, the mental stuff was not a challenge at all, really, because being older and wanting this for so long, and now I've got my chance, it's like there's nothing that's going to deter me. You know, whereas there was some younger guys, great guys who could run circles around me, but the instructors could play on their mind and just be like, you know, they had a bad day, you know, because they drank too much milk at breakfast or something. And it's curling in their gut, you know, and, and they're <laughs> holding their buddy back on a swim. And the instructor's like, you're holding your buddy back. You should just quit right now, you know, like, and just make them feel real bad about their buddy, you know. And so, so many guys get pulled out because of that. So, so the mental thing, like that side of it wasn't an issue. Um, the physical, like my body, um, amazingly like I was one of the top runners out of everybody there like um, when we were and it was partially due to the way we train and as people get older they tend to be better long distance runners it seems like you know you got 42 year old marathon runners that are just kicking right. ass so um, so yeah I'd be putting out hard on those runs and my body wouldn't rebound as as quickly like my I'd feel it in my hips for four days after um and but like anytime there was like a a mutter run like where it's spongy sand because of the way the surf was there was no hard pack I was always first and that was starting with uh, 212 guys and throughout the, the whole time I, I was on those runs I was always first now when there was hard pack I'd be like you know third or between third and fifth place but you know, you've got some college level um, officers, you know, that are just these, you know, studs, you know, that are marathon, you know, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. But when it was bad conditions, that's, that's where I was best because of the way I trained, you know, in soft sand with heavy boots, that kind of thing. So. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, thanks um, for sharing that. Yeah, you would have well, been an old man by far there, right? Yeah, yeah. 30, and there 31. was a couple guys older than me, but they didn't, they didn't make it through Hell Week. Um, and there's definitely been guys older, like I, th I heard a guy who was 38 who went through buds way, way back Holy cow. in the day. So, and as far as the hardness thing, like, yeah, it, it totally varies depending. Like, there's Hell Week is super hard, but the biggest part of it is just six months of never ending story. And every week there's one or two major evolutions to pass. And so it's not just, oh, I made it through Hell Week. Now everything's a breeze. No. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's some guys who would rather go through five Hell Weeks than go through one pool week because, you know, they're just not as comfortable in the water, um, that sort of thing. So it all yeah. depends. Yeah, everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses, but it sounds like you went in with a, a really strong background and a strong sense of purpose and why and why you wanted to be there. and. And, yeah. and your mission there. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that tangent. So I interrupted you. Keep going. No worries. Um, keep going. Which direction? <laughs> uh, it's, it, you were kind of telling your, your story of how you got from tracker school into, oh, into yeah. SEALs. And... Yeah. So um, on the SEAL teams, I did uh, close to six years active. And uh, then I, uh, I transferred to the reserves. And a lot of that was, you know, to try and save my previous marriage and uh, to be around my son. Cause when, you know, you're either deployed or you're training and it's um, ridiculous how few days you have it at home. So, and, you know, with my experience of what we did over in Iraq, it wasn't as much as what I was expecting. I thought, you know, we'd be a lot more sneaky peaky surgical, that kind of thing. But there was just a lot of just blowing, you know, the full front half of a building off to enter, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, the, the Intel was a lot of times it was, 
wrong. You know, it was it was just someone battle of the Joneses. Someone in the neighborhood said, "Oh, he's he's a terrorist." You know, and so you know we were a lot of times, you know, not um, not being as effective as we could be. So, gotcha. um, and there was plenty of times we we were being very effective, but you know, it, it just it was, uh, yeah. Anyway. And I know you're you're still in the reserves, made chief recently. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Took me a while. But <laughs> All good. And, yeah. I, think and I, I mean, I, I was avoiding it for a long time because I wanted to keep my door, my foot in the door in the reserves so I could screen at damn neck and they don't take chiefs uh, over there. So at least they didn't back then. And uh, yeah. So anyway. And you, I think you've mentioned along the way somewhere you have, I think, some pretty extensive medic training. Is that just in the course of, of your duties? So at the tracker school, um, I was wilderness EMT. Okay. And uh, so that's, you know, an EM EMT that can do a lot more stuff just because you're away from definitive care. And uh, so, you know, got to use that plenty at the, uh, at the tracker school with all the, you know, ticks and people cutting themselves and that kind of thing. But um, then in, uh, in the teams, you know, we get um, TT or so TCCC or is it triple TC or something, but it's, it's like, you know, three day, just intensive courses where there's plenty of live tissue type stuff. Um, and yeah, very, very extensive, even in buds, like you're, you're giving each other uh, um, IVs all the time, but you know, nothing like extensive, just it's, it's mainly combat medicine, keeping a person alive until someone who's better trained can, can get to them. I always wanted, I, I thought about going PJ, um, when I was making my choice. Um, and I wanted to go to 18 Delta, but they, they shut down that, um, I missed my window on that. Now, now we have medics attached to us instead of sending guys off because, you know, guys are constantly rotating out or, or getting out. And so they're not investing all that time medical into them all the time these days. So. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for the background. I had not heard some of that backstory before, but I think it's all, it's all super relevant context to the stuff you do now and the things that you do by business and by way of passion. So I appreciate you sharing yeah. that. Yeah. So I know, um, maybe, maybe one we can hit pretty quickly, um, uh, because there may not be a whole lot going on right now. So I know one of the businesses you run is something along the lines of outdoor training, survival, wilderness. Yeah. Correct yep. me where um, I'm wrong on that. T tell me yeah. more. So basically anything that has to do with um, basic survival to tracking to, you know, E and E type survival, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main focus is, and, you know, like tracking ties in with pretty much any aspect of life, even if you're not in a survival situation, but it's very crucial to, you know, hunting and, and, uh, um, looking for danger, that kind of stuff. So, um, but a lot of times, you know, I will fly out to where a group wants to be trained in their local resources because natural resources vary depending on where you're at and time of year and tracking environments vary from, you know, location to location and time of year. So, you know, law enforcement will have me come out and uh, teach them stuff for, you know, like sheriff's departments for, for tracking. Um, I also teach law enforcement and uh, civilians like, marksmanship and, and tactics. Um, so it, it all depends on what, what a group's looking for. And then, you know, I'll, I'll run classes where it's just introductory survival or more specialized where it's like just fire making or just bow and arrow making, you know, that kind of thing. So I haven't had a class schedule up for a long time and I was doing it more just by when people wanted me to come out to an area, just because when you lock your down self down to a schedule and a security gig pops up, you know, or something like that, um, you know, it's makes it, yeah, you got to say no to stuff. So, 
but yeah, I, this, you know, when I got back from deployment, you know, in, in 2018, it was going to be, you know, extensively teaching classes. And then I just, I had to take care of my, my uh, father and, and my mother's estate and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, yeah, that's just kind of dragged out for a while, but um, yeah, as soon as we can, you know, congregate and be closer than six <laughs> feet, you know, definitely have, have some classes up okay, and cool. yeah. And definitely, you know, going to be doing some mentoring stuff with uh, people who've been asking for a while, you know. All right, great. So um, let's, uh, let's hold on, on some of that stuff and we'll, we'll get into, you know, some of the foods and nature and foraging and uh, off grid or wilderness stuff um, because maybe a lot of people are thinking about that in, in yeah. the pandemic, but yeah. um, maybe just to put a, a bow on the business side of that right now. So um, it sounds like you've got all different kinds of specialties and formats and locations and ways you can deliver that. And we'll see how it evolves over the course of uh, when things, when we can congregate again. Right. Uh, right. But uh, for people who may be interested, if they want to organize a group, do one-on-one, or maybe even stay in tune to whether you start doing some online mentoring. Uh, and we'll, we'll throw up links and show notes on this one, but uh, Instagram, is that generally the best place to keep in tune with you or your website? Yeah. 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 It's, um, I don't have my website up right now. Um, but we've just basically been working through Instagram and Shopify. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. I know I'm, I'm excited. I've been waiting for those to come back for a while. I want to get, uh, get the whole family out with you somewhere at some point. Yeah. Talk about some, yeah, definitely some basic, uh, outdoor survival wilderness stuff. So I will, uh, I'll stay in tune to that. And then, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about knives. So a lot of, a lot of people yeah. know you, uh, as tracker Dan, the, the knife maker. Um, yeah. There's probably some more elegant title for that, but I, I know you make, uh, you make a line of, of knives that are, basically handmade, um, largely sort of custom. Um, yep. This is, uh, I don't know if Colt Classic is, is an appropriate label for this? I mean, it's probably bigger than that. You, this is a thing that has a multi-year wait list that's not even open right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, as far as knowing whether it's a Colt Classic or not, I, I mean, I, I don't get out enough to know what it's like for other similar s- um, situations where it might be able to be called a <laughs> cult classic, but yeah, they are very popular and, um, it's, uh, you know, and it, it's, i so when I was six years old, I demonstrated enough safety that my dad gave me my first knife. And, um, you know, I've always been interested since then, you know, tinkering with mother news articles and, you know, studying under, you know, a blade maker in in the nineties. And, um, I finally, you know, decided to get, get serious about it in 2008. And, um, and mainly it was because from my experience on the SEAL teams, the stuff they issued us, um, gear wise and blades and all that kind of stuff was, you know, the contracts they go for is something that's super durable that can, you know, last, you know, at least five years under heavy duress. So we get a pack that weighs probably um, 12 pounds heavier than it should just because they're making it bomb proof. And it's like, we got to, you know, cover some distance, you know? So we're sitting there cutting off all the extra tags and (laughs) zippers and everything like that. Um, So with our, our knife sheets, like, I soon learned in a tactical training environment and then overseas that when you're trying to put your knife away after using it, because I've had to use it on breacher problems, um, the tip wants to, you know, you've got these shoulders inside the mouth and it wants, if you don't hit that slot just right, it wants to hang up on the shoulders. So, you know, couldn't put it away in the dark. And if you, you can't turn on a light to put it away, so you got to ditch it because you got to get your gun back up. So I, I developed this um, sheath type system for the ones that the blades I was um, issued and then the blood blades I bought on my own. And uh, 
you know, it takes a long time to develop, you know, make a mold and everything to make it ambidextrous. And um, the, uh, everybody was seeing it and they were like, hey, I need one. So it got really old really fast making these, you know, intense, you know, intensive time going into these molds to make them just perfect. So, cause not every blade is made to go ambidextrous. And, but I want that, because in the dark, depending on how you're using it, and when you switch around, you need to just be able to put it away without, you know, fiddling. Or you may mount it on a different part of your body and you want the edge in a certain orientation. So ambidextrous is like key to my, my sheathing systems. And then, uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to make it so that in the dark, you can just, you can register by feel and put it away. And nothing's hanging up. And it can go in either way. And from everything I learned on the, at the tracker school, like the Apaches had ways where they could carry, they could switch a knife because of the sash they were, you know, had it attached to. They could uh, have it, you know, like diagonal across here for, you know, it was a combat type draw, or they could have it um, on their, you know, horizontal here or horizontal on the back, or they could mount it. I think forearm might have been one of the options, but. Like they, depending on what they were doing, like if they're stalking on their belly, they want the knife on their back, you know, and, you know, so, or if they needed something that's more concealed or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, this developing this clip um, made it so I could move this to my concealed carry positions, to my gear. I can have it on my boxer shorts while I'm sleeping, all that kind of stuff. And it's got a great cloth grabber. So, you know, the sheet doesn't come with the blade. I, I don't know of a plastic sheath I've ever tried that with a plastic clip that doesn't come with the blade most of the time. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. So after making one-offs of these sheaths, I decided to make the ideal blade that's something I would want to carry that goes optimally with this, you know, sheath system. And that's where blood shark came into being. So, Thin, light, not handle heavy because I, I wrap it with cord. And um, I like those colognes because they're nice and thin and light. So you're always going to have it with you. It's easy to have with. But, um, you know, the tips tend to be very pointy and so susceptible to snapping a lot easier. And you can't always tell which way the edge is. You know, they, they put some knurls here. But if you're feeling for knurls and you're feeling, you know, like I, I'd rather... <laughs> just be able to tell with my fingers which which way it's going and, and it adds retention and the uh, fishtail at the back or shark tail is more ergonomically designed to your hand for a screwdriver grip so if you gotta you know make a hole straight forward or or um, make a drill a hole in something you know it, it works really good for transferring back and forth and you don't have a lot of excess out here that can be snagged and because this is the weakest part of your grip. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling on. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. I like to put it in, in some historical context for myself, right? So I don't, I don't know yeah. what fascination drew me to blades, but like I, I can remember getting my first pocket knife as a kid. And I think I, you know, I don't have near the knowledge, but uh, I think I appreciate them as uh, almost a, you know, a work of art as much as, as a tool. And, and I was thinking about, you know, are you a, I don't know if you're an artist in what you do or you're a scientist in what you do, or it's probably both. But the way I, I think I got exposed to some more of the type of things you were just describing was, so a buddy of mine had, had uh, turned me on to your, your brand, your name, your, your, your knives, right? And, yeah. um, and because they are in, I, I guess I'll call it sort of short supply, high demand, there are places they get resold and right. uh, you know, I saw, I saw the dollar number and I think it's a multiple of what you sell them for directly, but I was going, Holy cow, you know, and yeah. you know, and it's a paracord wrapped piece of piece of steel. And then yeah. I saw like an hour long, I think Instagram live you did with Ed Calderon probably a year ago. Oh yeah. yeah. Man, you were going through, well, you know, it's, it's, it's wrapped instead of handled for balance and the blade is exactly this long because I can choke up on it and do a field tracheotomy if I have to. And just, yeah, yeah. you know, thing at the beveled edge, just design in every single element of it that, that have yeah. come from your years of experience and what worked and what didn't. 
Yeah. And, you know, one big thing at the tractor school was um, the guy who taught Tom Brown, you know, the old Apache, he was all about finding the common thread of truth that runs through all philosophies, all survival skills, all that kind of stuff. And so he was all about cutting away the stuff that wasn't necessary because, you know, so many blades these days have bells and whistles attached. So it's like the newest, latest scientific thing that, you know, this is going to save you guaranteed, you know, and, but it's, uh, it's sales gimmicks. And so I just wanted to remove everything that didn't need to be there and leave all the things that did. And so like no choils cause choils, that's, that's a, I don't know who came up with the choil, but it, it's a bad idea. You know, it's a snag point and it's a way to lose your blade, you know, and it's a way to not be able to cut free because it gets snagged up, you know? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things out there that people just take for granted. And, uh, and even to the point of, you know, the artist artistry side of it, you know, like I had a nickname cause I, I did 10 years of, of carpentry um, before going to the tracker school and this was high end, you know, finished carpentry. So my nickname was Stradivarius Stanchfield cause I didn't cut corners and like I, so I can make these knives to where they're mirror polished and, and just a work of art but I'd rather take that time and spend it on a good carry system because this is the other half of the battle. Like I'd rather have a $200 sheath and a $5 knife than the other way around. Cause this is what keeps it where I need it when I need it. And so, yeah, um, there's art in the design and there's attention to detail in the quality. Like, I make sure that my wraps go all the way up here. Like most people take them down to the bottom here because that's easy to do. But then you go to stab into something and your fingers going into the thickness of steel, not, it doesn't have support it. And people do it with solid handles too. They take them way low because it's quick and easy. And without having that support there, you're just, you're going to be leaving DNA behind, damaging your trigger finger, you know, things you don't want to do. So, um, yeah, focused on functionality, but, you know, wraps are tighter than any I've ever seen just because I've been doing knot work since I was a little kid. And and this, I actually came up with this this double ridge wrap back in the late 90s. It's now called Cobra Wrap or something. They, you know, somebody came out in 2010 um, with a, a tutorial on it. I didn't even know someone else turned me on to it. But, but like, this, this came from my mom teaching me how to do lock stitches when making moccasins. So I was like, hey, if I did lock stitches on this, then if any part of it gets cut or melted through or something, it doesn't all unravel. So, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot. Super cool. Yeah, there's, there's stuff behind stuff behind stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. like I, I, I heard some of your other stories about the, the sheath and again, trial and error. I think you, you said you had a story about jumping off a rock into a water and yeah. lost your yeah. sheath, had to go diving for it. Yeah. And that led to yeah. an innovation and, and yeah. there's the clip. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so attention to detail and experience that's gone into all that stuff, which is amazing for your product. Unfortunate maybe in the sense that, um, so I know others have taken your innovations and built them into their own products. And then yeah. even worse, there are counterfeits claiming to be yours out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned wanting to talk about business and, um, that, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, it can be a hard pill to swallow when, you know, you, you think you should be worried about China, but there's, <laughs> there's plenty of people, will stab you in the back uh, here in America. And, but you know, that's something you just, you got to realize that's been happening from the dawn of time. Anytime there's a good idea, it's going to be copied. And, you know, it's, and so many people are like, well, why don't you, you know, get lawyers on that and stuff. You could spend your whole life in legal battles and, and get nowhere. So, you know, it's, I have to take solace in the fact that I've hopefully made the industry better by introducing some real good design features that get replicated, copied, that kind of thing. What I really like to see is when people take my design and make it better, you know, like do an innovation that 
fills a gap that I wasn't filling, you know, or whatever, you know, like, and like, even on the clips, like there was time, the first iteration of the Utila clip, when I saw it, I was like, wow, that's, that's really awesome. That can probably replace my clip. You know, like, Hey, if I see something better out there, I want to use it. Like I'll buy clips from him, you know? And, but then I started playing with it and it was like, mm, it's, there's, there's some, but their latest version is it, it looks like it's got a lot of promise because a lot less snaggable and it's not going to cut your, your uh, clothing as much when you, you know, be rubbing up against something when you got a blade or a holster underneath your, so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly open to, you know, making things better and people making my stuff better. But yeah, the thing I, I don't appreciate and I wish, you know, more people were aware is um, cause they, they, people get ripped off when they're buying, you know, a counterfeit blood shark that looks like a five-year-old baby wrapped it, you know, and it's all slippy and slidey and, and, and just like it comes, comes to here and it's, you know, it, like people are paying big bucks for these things or they were, they were selling them as a tracker Dan blood shark um, for like 500 bucks. And, you know, back before, you know, there was secondary market stuff on it and it's just, that's, and that was from a lot of guys that I used to know. And it, it's, it's really, it's really surprising to see people who preach brotherhood and warriorship and all this kind of stuff. And it's just to lure people in so they can stab you in the back, you know? So, you know, that, that stuff happens and it'll always happen. Always has happened, you know, yeah. to, uh, not good. And so anybody, what's good that? on you? Good on you for taking the high road. I, I, you know, as much, much as you can. Yeah. Do yeah. You, and do you, you know, uh, just, Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the same with, um, and I mean that just a tangent into brotherhood, you know, like there's so many movements these days where like people want to be Spartans. They want to be, sorry, you know, <laughs> nothing against Spartans. They want to be Vikings. They want to be part of this group, like the, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you just really got to be careful that you don't, you're not just, a cog you become a cog in the wheel or a battery to support you know the people at the top this this pyramid scheme type thing which can apply to religions any institution and it can be things that started out as a great idea and they grow to a point where it just it takes a left turn and you don't even notice it you know and you're just bought in and i can understand that mentality coming from a time when it, our survival was based on it but we aren't in those times right now and, you know, if the infrastructure goes away, it is, is good to find a good band, but you got to be so careful of the brotherhood you choose because you get the wrong guy at the helm and you're supporting things that you normally wouldn't. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, forging uh, true, deep, meaningful, honest relationships is, yeah. uh, is, is tough. It's tough. Well, it's the hardest thing in life is to find the people you can truly trust. And that takes a lot of time. And, you know, and you can't just wall yourself off and not risk, you know, you got to risk and you're going to get burned sometimes. So it just happened. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, I, I know what you mean. I've had some, some bad business relationships. Um, unfortunately, you know, when, when you just don't, you're not on the same page and, and in a worldview yeah. sense or an ethical sense and, you know, in your values and, uh, you know, in some ways I think a business relationship is just as hard as a marriage, you know, finding, but we don't we don't tend to vet those out as much as we do our our personal yeah. relationships. So, yeah. um, just on the on the innovation note and, and the idea of you know you'd love to see uh, yeah an industry where you're all making each other better and go through those cycles. So and and you've and that's that's a tough one because we live in a profit based society. So, you know, like with you get in certain like you know this hammer in I just went to you, you've got like these, you know, top, not top line blade, blade masters, you know, bladesmiths, all that, that are just sharing their knowledge and all that kind of stuff, you know, cause it's, it's an art and it, they're keeping the art alive. They're passing it on. And, you know, I came from that type of culture in, in the tracker school and, and the survival stuff where you're just sharing it cause we're making each other better and all that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to, feeding your family, you know, and I was sharing this stuff with the wrong people. And then 
it's like they're messing with my ability to feed my family and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's a tough one, you know, and I get questions all the time, like, where did you get that, you know, the source that, you know, and it's like something that took me three years to find, you know, and, or to develop. And it's like, man, I'd love to share, but it's like, you know, there's, you know, I do it with people that I'm really close with that I know are going to use it, you know, it, for their needs and not to like undercut me, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, so that's a tough one. Kind of. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a balance. Um, and I, I wish we lived in tribal societies where, you know, everything's for the good of the tribe and nobody's going to be like stabbing each other in the back, but right. I'm sure it happened, happened in those scenarios too, but you're a smaller, a smaller thing and you know, shit and where you eat doesn't happen as much, you know, <laughs> right. Cause yeah, everybody kicks your ass, you know, more repercussion. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. that's tough. The balance between kind of perpetuating an art versus giving away intellectual property that's putting, putting bread on the table. Yeah. The, um, so the, the blood shark and you've got some others that I'm, I'm probably, um, minimizing the thought that went into these, but I sort of see them as like different sizes or different configurations of a similar design. But when you get yeah. into like the Guadagna, if that's how you pronounce it, is that, was that an idea you came up with or was that more of a collaboration that you ended up making? That was a collaboration with, um, Ed's manifesto. It was. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, yeah. There I'd spent some time, you know, over in the middle East in Iraq and then in Jordan. And so I was, studying the blades over there and i really wanted to come up with a persian style even though it it's not easy to ambidextrously sheathe and uh so i've been really lucky that way like when i wanted to make a pistol grip style blade you know i came across you know al who was working with designs like that and we did a collaboration for the the punch badger and then same with Ed, it's like, I was thinking along the lines of Persian and he had had some experience with Persian type blades. And so, um, we, uh, we worked on that one a lot, you know, like we made a lot of different versions just to make it just right. So and a lot of people don't, don't appreciate, uh, the time that goes into make, you know, there's some things where it's just, well, oh, I'm going to make something crazy like this cause it's going to be unique, but like, everything I design has to be just as optimal as it can be. And uh, so we worked on that one a lot. And then the Elvia, we went through like probably, you know, over 12 different prototypes, you know, before we got that right. And, you know, and that's a lot of time put in cutting out the steel grind, you know, like tweaking things. And then, you know, people just, you know, I, I saw this one guy, he's making a, a Guadagna Elvia type thing, or he made, yeah. And it's just like, and he's asking me if he can use my sheath design and I, you know, Hey, kudos on you for asking, but like, what about the, the blade? You know, it's like, <laughs> so, and you know, that's Ed, Ed is very, you know, like he's teaching. So he's very free in sharing um, his designs and stuff. So, you know, it, it's, it just happens, but, um, but yeah, the, um, any other questions on the Gridania? Like no, no, no. I just I think it's uh, you know again kind of not only form and function, but the art of it is is amazing, and and the ambidextrous yeah. sheath for that is is uh, is just genius. Um, well, maybe in the interest of time, let's let's pivot towards um, some of the the health, nutrition, yeah, uh, yeah. mind, body stuff. But to put a bow on the on the knife business, so um that i know is is a ridiculous backlog to it as far as i know the books are closed i do yeah. know you for the for the custom stuff i know you occasionally will drop more of a production style you've got some stuff you do for uh, charity from time to time if mm -hmm. people keep in touch with you and i know you you're always passionate about putting tools in the hands of first responders who are out there using it you know in in harm's way so yeah. Uh, again, Instagram, Facebook, that's the best way to keep in touch on those. Yeah. Instagram and my Instagram's li linked to my face or the, yeah, my Facebook. And then there's a couple of Facebook groups, um, users and collectors, and then the first responder page that are run by other people. So if you can get into those groups, you know, I do lottos and auctions on those 
those sites um, or on Instagram tends Perfect. to be on the Facebook groups just because Instagram's open to like it's not controlled at all so it's you can get people in there just um, yeah causing causing issues you know putting in a bid and they never intended to buy it you know that kind of stuff right so yep okay great understood and um, and you know those the rest of us who develop an appreciation for what you're doing want to get on the list we'll we'll keep in tune and uh, see if the if the cool. books open in the future sounds good so um yeah health mind body working out i noticed you got a you got a pump strap or whatever it's called there on your arm yeah um, yeah yeah i've been so playing around with uh some different stuff you know um just you know with the injuries i've i've sustained in the past um you know i can't go balls to the wall you know on my workouts like i could when i was younger so working out smarter you know and and paying attention to the science that's out there um you know like the the changes that have happened over the decades just in stretching and you know warm outs and warm ups and cool downs and all that kind of stuff so um yeah and you know without a strong body it's hard to keep the the mind uh doing all the things it um wants to do so no, no doubt that's uh that's a foundation yeah. and most of us can always use work on that I mean, if if we just um if we kind of start on daily routine um, yeah you know besides just exercise but do you have a you have a daily ritual you know a morning routine that you do to, to prime yourself for the day you know physically hydration mentally whatever that might be yeah yeah um I, i've been getting into the carnivore code a bit so um he recommends like three grams of salt, you know, good, good, uh, you know, Redmond or, uh, um, Himalayan salt, you know, in a glass of water. Um, and yeah, just staying well hydrated and like, I'll, I'll throw on, uh, the, uh, the bands, you know, the katsu bands. And cause that just, it um, has so many incredible benefits and anybody who, wants to look into it deeper. Maricola has so many articles on it, you know, the, the blood flow modification. And I know there's a lot of blood flow restriction out there. And, you know, I, I hear there's some difference, um, but I haven't looked into the blood flow restriction enough to know what the difference is, but it's, um, it's a way to keep your blood vessels, you know, limber and create more blood vessels because it's actually, you're, you know, kind of getting a, a blowing up a balloon type effect. And uh, so it can create human growth hormone. It can be used, you know, like if your leg's in a cast and you put that thing on, you, they say you heal twice as fast and you have no atrophy once once the thing comes off or the cast wow. comes off. So, yeah, they're, they're using it in NSW. Uh, and I heard, heard about it from an old frog um, as far as actually getting really introduced to it. and um but for a lot of rehab stuff but also for they're using it the Olymp olympians are using it and all kinds of kinds of stuff so it's it's pretty interesting uh modality could and especially for older people it keeps it prevents sarcopenia which can lead to um what is the uh, uh blanking osteoporosis oh, okay so it can actually you know cause your bones to densen up you know and and not have muscle wasting as, as you get older. So, wow. um, Super yeah, cool. it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, but that's something I can do while I'm, I'm, uh, planning out my day, you know, or, or typing emails on in the morning. And, uh, I like, uh, the mobility wad, um, guys stuff, like, you know, just getting down in that squat position. So you're ready for the squatty potty, <laughs> but, you know, like get keeping your hips and, and knees and all that stuff, uh, you know, getting them all kind of warmed up for the day, I think is, is always a, a good idea. Um, and, you know, diet wise, um, I've always tried to steer towards something that would be sustainable for a transition to full survival. So, you know, I've had instances where I went, you know, from my regular carb heavy diet to total survival 
for two weeks and just the energy loss, you know, of, you know, going from, <laughs> you know, like bread and, and all the other kind of things we, you know, shoved down to, you know, grasshoppers and some wild edibles and some mussels, you know, from the stream. I mean, it is eye opening. So, um, having my body, you know, so it burns fat, you know, as opposed to sugar and all that kind of stuff is, is key. Cause that's what you're going to be looking for in, in survival. Um, so, is your, okay. Getting into, yeah. get, getting into fat adapted rather than sugar fueled. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So if, if we mainly for longevity, right. For quality of life and to be able to transition into grid down scenario kind of thing. So do you have any, um, um, so I was just thinking about this one. So I haven't gone, um, carnivore code, but keto. And yeah. one, of the, one of the things I've done, you know, when you're in, nobody's traveling right now, but when you're in transit, you know, long flight, stuck in an airport, yeah. things like that, it gets, you know, you're sitting there looking at the junk you can choose from and it's, it's not yeah. great. So yeah. there's, there's a company out here and I think they're in San Diego, at least in California called Ample Foods. And yeah. they make a, uh, a, a powdered bottled um they've got a few different but they've got a keto one and you can just okay. add water so i always have a few bottles of that in my backpack dump some water in it and shake yeah, yeah. it up and it's it's uh it's all high quality ingredients and it's uh, keto proportioned you know the high nice. high quality fat yeah uh, content on the go oh that's awesome yeah so i know you're not going to forage for that but uh in you know yeah, as long as, no, as we've got a supply chain well, we're, we're all doing a lot of travel these days and that's, that kind of stuff is, is key. So I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah. Check that out. So if, um, you know, if we're in a place where we just want to enjoy the outdoors or we get back to supply chain breaks down or grid goes down and, and, you know, we're, we're in that position and maybe yeah. most of us are gotten soft and don't have that knowledge. So maybe yeah. just, you know, we mentioned hydration just as a morning thing really quickly, but you know, yeah. when you're, when you're back country, when you're outdoors, what, I mean, water is just, it's heavy to carry enough of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's your, what's your philosophy on finding or, do you, you know, do you carry filters or you have a natural solution to that? Yeah. Um, and it's become a lot harder because of, you know, our environmental toxins we've, you know, put into the environment. So you got to take a lot of extra steps unless you've got a pristine spring or, source somehow so um the main main thing you got to do you know from any natural water source is is boil it so as long as you bring it to a boil you know you're safe so you're not going to be vomiting and shitting and, and dehydrating yourself more um so that you know that could have chemicals in it and you might die from that later down the road unless it's a high concentration but you know you're at least staying hydrated so you can add on to the boiling. And so with, for boiling and, you know, I mean, there's even tricks that, you know, they use over in Africa with the clear water bottles on the rooftops. They get enough, if you've got a place where you got enough UV and a clear enough bottle, you can sterilize it that way of anything that would, uh, you it would, know, it would cause you. Evaporating within the, the bottle, kind of a distilling effect? No, nope, no, nope, it's, it's just counting on UV to oh, okay. kill. And it does have to get up to a certain temperature. Can't remember if it was like 140 or something, but um, but yeah, that's that's an option. I would steer away from that just because of the PCBs that you're going to get. But if it's your only option, then it keeps you alive. Right. So as far as boiling, you need to know how to make a fire for one. So you either got to have that with you, or you got to know how to make primitive fire, and then um, you got to be able to make a container. So a container can be, you know, an animal stomach that you just killed. Um, it could be an animal hide because, you know, maybe not everybody knows this, but like paper, even a plastic bag or just any kind of thing that you hold over fire, as long as it's got water in it, it doesn't burn through because the heat transfers to the water. I did not know that. Yeah. So it's amazing what you can boil in um, on coals or on a fire. You just can't let the fire get up past the edges of where the water line is. So there's a lot of um, 
so that you know the animal stomach, animal hide. There's certain tree barks that you can cut off the inner, you know, get to the inner tree bark and peel it properly, and you can fold that into a container that you can set on the coals and boil, um, boil in, and you can uh, make clay pots if you've got a clay source, or if there's a lot of clay by the bank of the river. This is an old Tom Brown trick. Like you can dig out into the clay a depression and and scoop scoop some water in there and then heat some rocks and drop them in it and boil it that way without uh -huh. it you don't have to make pottery you know because it's you know and you, you're gonna have a little clay in your water but who cares and so you know if for any type of you know you, you st once you have to make those type of things you realize how how nice it is to have a little you know pot or a frying pan yeah um, right because right. it makes life a lot easier it's a lot more durable especially when you're you know moving around and stuff like that On the nomadically look if you're looking for other natural resources and such so um but yeah there's there's lots of options with that now if you can take it further to where you're actually making um so going beyond so we kind of covered boiling Yep. But going beyond that, you've got filters. So you can easily make filters off the landscape with, uh, you know, as long as you don't pick poisonous plants, but you can use like fibrous um, grasses and stuff like that and uh, different different types of inner bark fibers to make a type of one layer of filter. Um, and that would be like your top layer. Under that, you have sand. And then under that, you have charcoal, if you have access to charcoal. So you can make incredibly effective filters like that. And I've shown that before with uh, three handkerchiefs that I learned from an old frog uh, from Bulletproof Primitive. Um, amazing guy. But he had it's real packable because it's three bandanas that you can use for warmth on your head. But you pull it out and it's like three parachutes under each other and it's just got grasses in the top, sand in the next one and charcoal in the bottom one. And he had the local official test it, like who was part of the municipal water supply thing. And he said, that stuff's better than what we're <laughs> sending you. <laughs> so, wow. so there's that, which can take out a lot of, you know, other contaminants like heavy metals and that kind of stuff. And that could possibly get out a lot of your bacterial and viral um, and amoebas and all that kind of stuff possibly but I'd, i would boil just to be sure on that and then if you want to go to the next level you do solar stills um, or a heated still where you're heating the water and evaporating and then cooling it so that if you're ever going to do that though you've got to make sure you boil the water first because there's a lot of chemical contaminants that have a lower boiling point than water does so they will actually concentrate in your collecting pot. So boil the water first, run it through the still, and that gets rid of everything. Wow. Okay. So great yeah. tips. Amazing. But it's 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 a lot of a lot of time and energy, you know. So right. Um, yeah. So it, and it, and it sounds like you know there's kind of a prioritization or, or triage. Not only what resources do you have, but again, are you on the move? How much time do you have to put into it? What, yeah. What's your survival necessity at that point? Yeah. Um, and yeah, go ahead. and like, I, I never travel without like, a, this isn't uh, the clean canteen, but this, you know, one of those thin walled stainless steel, not the insulated ones. So I can kick boil water with it. I can cook in it, all that kind of stuff. Cause in a survival situation, you're going to be doing a lot of stews. You're not going to be, you know, you might do some cooking directly on the coal with meat and stuff like that. But generally you do stews cause you maintain your nutrients. You're not losing you know, the moisture from the meat and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about nutrients. So, uh, you threw a couple things on Instagram, I think this morning or, or yesterday. Um, so when it comes to, well, um, I don't know, I'm not sure the best place to start, but, and you mentioned earlier that, uh, what you have available in the environment is going to differ by, by season, by location, things like that. So this is a, just a super general question. If you, yeah. if you had to live on, is there a, plant based a fruit or a vegetable is there a single perfect food that if you were in one location you could have it in abundance 
you know, can, can you live on an avocado? Can you live on coconut? Is there like a perfect, perfect fruit or vegetable? Um, I know there's, there's a lot of native groups that, uh, got through the winter, you know, on 500, you know, a family would gather 500 pound of acorns and process them. Wow. Um, cause you got a lot of fats and protein in there and carbs. Um, ah, uh, you know, it's people have said honey is the perfect food. There's, you know, at times, you know, like it, some people say coconuts are, you know, like, but I've, you know, I, I like to, I keep my ear to the ground for, you know, the latest science on things. And I'm not thinking of anything that plant-based, you know, that, that would have everything because, you know, there, <laughs> and this whole plant-based thing that's been kicking off, like there's a couple of my seal buddies who were, who were doing it. And, and it's funny because like they're eating donuts cause it's, it's plant-based, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they, you know, whatever. like, yeah. but you know, the guys who are being more healthy about it, like they're allowed to add, broth you know bone broth bone broth yeah because apparently the plants aren't giving you everything you need so you know the b vitamin thing is 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 something i don't i don't know of any plant sources but you know i'm just loosely speaking from memory so yeah i i i can't really really think of anything um and are there, uh, and you mentioned, uh, is it oxalates that, uh, yeah, yeah. that you can build up in so it's almost acid, like, yeah. oxalic acid. so it's almost too much of a good thing, too much spinach, too much of that green smoothie things yeah. that maybe we were meant to eat seasonally. That's yeah. The way I think of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and at the tractor school, I, I would teach people wild edibles and medicinals and stuff like that. And, you know, I knew from the books, which ones were super high in oxalic acid. And you could put some of them in your salad as flavoring because it can almost have a lemon, lemony type fit flavoring, like wood sorrel and stuff like that. But you get too much of it and it tears up your stomach. Um, so yeah, the, the oxalates is one of those things where some people are going to have a really bad reaction to it um, that they notice. And other people it's still affecting them, but they're probably not going to see it till later on in life. And it's the thing is when we can get that spinach and the various other things 24 seven, it just keeps on building and our body keeps on depositing. And, you know, cause you got to pull calcium, phosphorus and magnesium out of your system to bond with this stuff, to protect your body, which creates these nasty spiky crystals. And then that either becomes, you know, you know, in your kidneys, it becomes kidney stones. In other areas, it becomes um, joint arthritis or pain. And it, it tends to lodge where um, injuries, old injuries happen, and stuff like that. And if you're never giving your body a break where it can detox, and if you're not detoxing properly, it can be a pretty uh, brutal process to get that stuff out of your system. So, right, so with the carnivore diet, are you on, I'll just skip to that for a second. Are you on a yeah. 100% meat uh, as far as nutrients. Is that how that works? I'm yeah, mostly I I'm doing ish kind ish. of ish cause I'll, I'll have some avocados every once in a while, break it up um, and steal one of my wife's cookies every, every now and then. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm making sure to do it like, you know, like adding in the, you know, the liver, good grass fed liver. You know, I was always told, you know, like, we can't eat, you know, kidneys or liver these days because all the toxins in the environment, those are filter organs and you're going to be just, you know, and that's when you get into the science of it from that, that carnivore code book, it's not, not the case. Um, it is, you know, they play a part in that, but it, it's not like it's storing up all those toxins. Um, it's helping your body get rid of those toxins, but, um, so if you're getting good grass fed stuff, organic, you know, it's, it's not an issue. And, and the vitamins and nutrients you get from those different organ meats and the bone marrow and all that kind of stuff is just amazing. And like bone, 
bone stock is is just one of the most you know it it probably was in everybody's diet back in ancestral times um but you know like it's just so rare these days and and it's so easy to make you know like um and like you can get two cookings out of the bones and still be getting like just tons of good minerals and 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 vitamins especially if you're adding in a little uh you know apple cider vinegar it, that draws a lot more stuff out so yeah, my my son, uh, he he laughs at me every time we uh, we take down a couple of those Costco rotisserie chickens. You know, yeah, the, the carcass is going in the slow cooker with uh, yeah, yeah, you know, with some nice. vegetables, some, nice, uh, some nice. cider, some salt and pepper, and you know, yeah, a bunch yeah. of water, and just let it cook for a few days. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, on the plant thing, you know, there are definitely pharmaceutical qualities to plants, and where they they should be used to get over a certain ailment at a certain time, but taking them all the time, nonstop, you know, um, as a, as a, as a full on nutrition plan. You also mentioned, yeah. um, some wild edibles that are really nutrient dense. If you are in that yeah. foraging and survival scenario. So you, you mentioned earlier today in a, in an Instagram video, nettles, dandelion greens and kelp. Yeah. So this, um, native uh medicinal man um would come to the tracker school and teach us like just super in-depth very scientific uh you know like he could talk for four hours on the benefits of dandelion leaves wow. you know just and we're buying roundup to to right. poison them you know it's like and poison ourselves, and poison ourselves. yeah exactly yeah um i lost a um an aunt aunt in law not too long ago from to round up. Um, it's just ridiculous. But so um, he was saying that with um, dried up nettle leaves, dried up um, dandelion leaves and dried up kelp, like all ground up and put in a um, pepper shaker, like he'd say, sprinkling that on to season your food and stuff, you're replacing all the nutrients that are lacking from our modern farming techniques. Wow. You know, because we're using synthetic fertilizers and just raping the soil, like of all the nutrients, you know, after a few crops, you know, so. So I, I don't need all these uh, man-made vitamins <laughs> and supplements that I'm probably peeing down the toilet. Hey, I mean, some of them are, are probably, <laughs> you know, providing something that, that won't, but. Uh, I just need the shaker full of nettles, dandelion and kelp and I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Now with, you know, I used to eat a lot of nettles and um, I would want to look into that more um, for men who are, you know, over the age of 30, you know, we start to accumulate iron because we're not menstruating every month. So, you know, if you accumulate over a certain amount of iron in your body, you're more susceptible to a lot of diseases you wouldn't have been. So given blood like three times a year, would be a good idea if you're eating a lot of red meat eating things like nettles guinness beer is just full of iron and there's a lot of other food sources too so um so i would want to look into the nettle thing a little bit more as yeah, far I know as you've mentioned the the blood donation i think mercola's got some stuff on that i yeah. try to give as much blood yeah. as i can through spartan race and and nice. Krav Maga. <laughs> <laughs> bloody nose here and there but no yeah, that's yeah. that's a good one for men I, you know and you know some of the stuff i think we, you know we we kind of laugh at history sometimes instead of learning from it yeah you, know, you look yeah. back on even just a couple hundred years ago founding fathers you know leeching bloodletting yeah um, things that yeah. we think of as primitive but maybe they were primitive and, and very useful and brilliant yeah or um brilliant by accident you know what else plenty of times they were they were bleeding when they shouldn't have <laughs> good, good point but, yeah i don't yeah. think it fixes a broken bone but uh, yeah yeah <laughs> what so some of the things like um are, are there any things that that can be foraged for so i know a lot of things you have to learn you know you have to learn yeah, which yeah. things are poisonous or not you don't want to yeah. be the guy from the tribe that has to go off and try it <laughs> you know be yeah. the guinea pig yeah. but yeah. are there are the things that are largely universally available around at least let's say north america and that are easy yeah. to distinguish so i don't know maybe dandelions is one 
Yeah, and there, I mean, there are some plants that could be mistaken for dandelions, and but I don't think they're like, you know, deadly. You know, may just be an uns upset stomach, but uh, mainly you you've got to identify things when they're in flower because the flower is the most unique aspect of a plant. So that's how it has sex with other, you know, plants of its species. So um matching the flower um how the leaves or branches come off whether they're alternate or opposite or world um the leaf type you know whether it's toothed lobed you know entire you know that kind of thing or leaflets you know these these are the three things you can put together to know exactly what a plant is and if you have the right book it can you know it gives you a key that puts you right on that page. Like Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is just invaluable for that. Um, but with wild edible plants, if you don't know what something is, you should not put it in your mouth because there are things out there, you just touch your tongue to them, you'll die. So especially in the carrot family, like there's plenty of edible things and then there's things, you know, that was it Socrates that had to do the hemlock tea? Socrates. Someone, some philosopher way back in the day. Um, so, and poison hemlock is is in the carrot family. So, um, so as far as ones that are readily available and grow everywhere in the states, the uh, is the big four is what uh, we taught at the tracker school, and uh, that's um, acorns pines grasses acorns pines grasses and cattails cattails yeah yep okay so um acorns you know you some acorns are are too bitter to even process but um plenty you can leach the the tannins out of and then just great source of of food uh, but that's only going to be a certain part of the year. Um, pines, you can eat the um, pine nuts, which are the seeds inside the, the female cones. You can eat the male cones, which are those little clusters of the things that give off all that pollen. Mm -hmm. So you can eat them before they dry out and give off the pollen. Um, you can eat, you can gather the pollen, you know, if you have a, a bag you can just shake shake them in and you'd be surprised at how much you can gather and that's just nutrient dense like you wouldn't believe really um, so I, I, grew oh, up yeah. in, I grew up in georgia i mean you don't even have to try to gather it it's yeah, all yeah. it's all yellow at one point in the yeah year. yeah i wish you know we didn't have so many toxins in the environment because like when you know it gathers in a puddle and then dries right. it's just like a cake of that stuff yeah yeah um so with pines you can also use the pine needles to make um, vitamin C type drink, you know, like as long as you don't heat it above 108 degrees, you know, so just smashing the needles and putting them in a cup of cold water or lukewarm or sun tea. Um, you can eat the inner bark. You, and you mentioned just on the needles, four times the vitamin C of, of an orange. Yeah. And I don't know how they gauge that measurement wise, like <laughs> by volume or yeah. 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 yeah okay. Um, I, it was so long ago that I, I looked deeply into that stuff. So, um, skipping on to grasses. So all grasses are edible except for two species that are super rare and down in the Southwest. Um, and they'll probably be a little on the noxious side or just look shiny and, or reddish or something, you know, so for the most part, you're, you're safe with grasses. And when they're young, you know, before they get a lot of silica built up in them, um, you can chew them up and eat them. But, you know, when they're not, you can just chew, chew the leaves up and spit out the pulp and just swallow the, uh, the juices. Um, the roots, you can, you can boil and, and eat. The uh, seeds, you can gather you know, just like you would any other grain, they're going to be a lot smaller most of the time. 
and uh, you got to you know be careful of ergot, which is a fungus that can can grow on. Uh, it's pretty serious, but you, you'll notice it like the it'll be a seed that's black or purple and and like five times bigger than the other seeds, okay. and that's that's what they think caused the Salem witch, witch trials is because you know guys that eat this and get paranoid like it causes paranoia and shakes and and so they were thinking this spell was cast on them and stuff like that but, um so that's it for grasses then cattails you can you just got to make sure you don't mix up cattails with irises because irises are very poisonous so they have similar leaves but you know if you know what to look for it's it's pretty you know and there's good books books on this stuff um but right. the cattails yeah lots can be eaten the seed head the stock you know depending on what stage you get them at and the roots roots are great so cool i might uh, hit you up later for some links on books for that stuff cool. um so i got i got two more kind of categories for you i'll, I'll try not to take yeah. up too much more of your time here but no um I mean, minerals, we're kind of inherently talking about minerals, but you mentioned clay earlier. Is, is there anything mineral wise that you like to carry or make sure is in your diet for minerals or for detox effect? Um, so where I'm going to go with this as I go forward is I'm counting on my minerals from, you know, plant or uh, animal sources. And you mean, are you talking about things like bentonite clay for cleansing and stuff yep, like that? Yep. Um, that's a controversial one. And I don't know where it's at these days, but some people say, depending on the source of it, it can be very high in aluminum. Now, I don't know if the clay keeps the aluminum bound. I, 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 I don't know, but um, I've, I've definitely used it in the past when doing uh, long cleanses and stuff. And as far as cleanses go, going forward, I'm just going to water fast, you know, because with the intermittent fasting that I started uh, January of 2019, that, you know, getting in the practice of that, that enabled me to do a five-day water fast, no problem. And um, on this carnivore diet, I'm just going to have one day a week. Actually, that was supposed to be today. Damn it. I'll have to move it to tomorrow. <laughs> I already had something today. But I'm, you know, one day a week, I'm going to fast. And then a certain number of days a month. And this, yeah, I, I, I want to set it up kind of like a regimen. Because it, it, yeah, it keeps it simple, straightforward. I mean, I've done some really intensive, crazy fasts or uh, cleanses um, when I was at the tracker school. but. Um, so these days, are you are you so are you aiming for a day, twenty four hours, a day a week, uh, a fast, and then do you do the do you do daily intermittent fasting too, where you jam your your meals into six or eight hours? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to, um, you know, not eat close to bedtime at all, like at least three hours from bedtime, and in the carnivore code, like he's eating probably six hours before bedtime, and there's there's a lot of benefit to that and and yeah shortening the window so it's it's uh yeah and on the i mean it's it's a it's a hunter it's a hunter diet and um so you know if you think how much you have to work to get that meal and the spaces in between you know and the nutrients that you're getting from it that carry you over like the fat you know like you just you don't need to constantly be feeding right. yourself so um, my experience with it was once you you kind of get used to it, yeah, you know, and that may be more mental and routine than it is than it is physical, but you get yeah. adapted to it and you got the fat for fuel, you get used to going stretches, you get used to going a day um, mm -hmm. there's no energy issues in fact, I think yeah. it's kind of the opposite you kind of get get a pump effect, you yeah. get an energy effect yeah. that you can go out I mean you can still work out i've done done long long runs i've done interval training. Well, and, and the, the healing it allows your body to do when it's not processing food is it's just off the charts. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the one other category, it's, it's a huge one, but we'll throw it out there 
kind of quickly yeah. is um, self-protection. So yeah. do you have any universal thoughts on that or does it come down more to what people are trained on and comfortable with? So I would say awareness is number one because even if you're, you know, the baddest Spartan out there, you know, someone can hit you in the back of the head with a two by four if you didn't see him coming. So awareness is key. Um, we live in a very distracted world where, you know, people are making themselves, setting themselves up to be victims because they are just not aware of their environment and they're not avoiding something that they could have because they're locked into their phone or whatever or worrying about stuff, you know. So that's key to anything, any level that you're going to attain to because that gives you the possibility of avoidance, the possibility to meet with the proper, you know, force, um, or yeah. So avoidance with, would fall up, you know, would cover running and hiding and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, yeah, as far as self-protection, you know, just in this day and age, just always having something that can either be in your hand or can be close to hand to defend yourself with. Um, and I'm, I'm all about if people are into, you know, doing some crazy, you know, stuff that's just empty hand and it's good to have that, but there's nothing that beats a pin raking down across your face, <laughs> you know, like, so it's a force multiplier. Anytime you can have a force multiplier, but you build confidence in yourself by being able to do the empty hand stuff. But if, if you're just focusing on, if that's your main focus, you're, you're missing out on something that can make you way more effective. And if you've got multiple opponents, I don't care how good you are at this, it's only going to go so far. So, you know, and every situation is going to, going to dictate, you know, there's certain situations where you need a belt fed weapon, you know? And so it's, you, you just, you got to learn what's appropriate. And it, it's funny how many people have been trying to get guns who don't believe in them <laughs> lately because things are looking a little crazy, you know, and, and you can't get toilet paper, you know, like somebody <laughs> might come and take mine, you know, like, so, you know, it's, yeah, I, yeah, it's a good I would point say on it's that. the number one concern in any kind of survival situation is being able to protect yourself because that can take your life in an instant. Whereas the need for shelter, you know, that could be, up to three hours, um, water, three days, food, three months, you know. So when you look at your levels of priority, security is, is definitely at the top. Um, so, cool. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like the point about just adaptation and things on hand, whether it's, you know, it's the pen. Yeah. I think you, yeah. it, it might have been you that's mentioned you know, having some rocks around, you run into wild dogs out on a run or in, out for a hike. Yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't always have to be a man-made weapon. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a weapon at all. Like a pen, um, you know, the way you have your keys set up, like, you know, the bottle shark I have on, on my keys, that, that thing, the raking that you could do and, and the damage, you know, just, you know, it's not going to go in and get internal organs, but it's going to, take eyesight possibly, you know, take the fight out of somebody, um, you know, and there's all kinds of just simple little things that you can have in your hands. That's yeah, that can, yeah, they change, uh, change the course of events. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, people are definitely worried. There's cause for concern. There's a lot of uncertainty and, um, yeah. and fear and, and those things have a dividing effect oftentimes as opposed yeah. to coming together and, 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 like and we were I, talking about earlier. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really like where, you know, the stance Trump has on this, where he's, he's, he's trying to talk sense into people to an extent, like, cause this fear thing can really spin out of control. And like you read, you know, 
the stats and the science and everything that Maricola presents. And it's like this and, and a, a good doctor friend of Kelly's um, is just, she is livid with the way this thing is being spun. Like, cause she's been in situations where, you know, AIDS epidemic and putting people through their, you know, their last rites, like, you know, hospice, all this kind of stuff. And, and she's like, anytime somebody gets the sniffles in the past and then any, like, or any little thing, she hears about it. And on this, it's like, she hasn't heard of anyone that she knows who has it for her, who's contracted it for one or who needs a ventilator bed. And it's just like, this is being spun up so much politically and whatever. And, you know, I know there was, and I know we're getting off on a political tangent, but there was so many people, you know, in the past on those, you know, left-wing comedy shows and stuff where they're talking about, well, if it takes destroying the economy to, to get Trump out of office, like, and, you know, it's like, are, is that what's causing some of this, you know, like, and cause it's, you know, it remains to be seen how how devastating it will be or or could be. But I, I really think that it's it's being blown out of proportion in way. Like, you know, when you've got the governor of California talking, mentioning martial law, what's that? You're not going to do it, but you're going to mention it, and now everyone's going to go buy everything off the shore. The, you know, it's 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 just it's unnecessarily causing. You know, and there's certain people who are getting a lot of press out of this, like all the disaster response type type angles. Like, you know, they're they're like in the limelight. Oh, we're the special people now. We're we're going to save you all. And it's like I think they're making it seem worse than it is. And I mean, you know, but you know, we'll, remains to be seen. You know, like, um, but. Uh, it's definitely going to have a devastating effect that's going to last for a little while just because of the amount of time people have been away from their jobs and all that. So, Yeah, no doubt about it. It's already starting to ripple. I think where I'm at on it is, is um, don't really know sort of cause and effect. Don't know, you know, yeah. if, if some of this is hype by design or people capitalizing, unfortunately, on, uh, yeah. on the situation. And that's the problem with, and we don't know yet how long this lasts or how, how bad it's going to be. We're all, yeah. a lot of us are trying to do the right thing and play our yeah. part, right. In, in minimizing whatever it is. Yeah. But the problem is, is the uncertainty and, and that fear, mm -hmm. fear has the same effect, whether it's real or imagined. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, totally. and it, it creates all, it creates, there's the internal effect of all the stress yeah. and everything that's doing to our bodies. And then there's the external and the relational effect and, you know, fear of our neighbors and just, you know, you can yeah. spin that the ripple effect. Well, and, of that. and I'm, I'm curious, you know, how many of our, our rights we're going to give up during this, this one, like what mandatory vaccine is going to come out that like, if you don't get it, you're going to cause all of us to die. You know, this whole herd mentality bullshit is, it does not work off an injected vaccine. That is from mucosal transference from the mother to the kid. It takes time, you know, and it's, it's like, Oh, there's just so much stuff used that the, the cell stuff out there. That's we don't need keep your immune system strong clean food, food, clean water, get plenty of exercise. I mean, ah, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. And I, and I guess maybe just to, to head towards wrapping up on that note, I, I guess I would add yeah. to that, um, sunshine, you know, vitamin yes. D for immunity, vitamin fresh D air. Big. I saw a good article about the Spanish flu pandemic from, you know, a century mm -hmm. ago where yeah. they were using a, in a similar situation, building outdoor medical facilities, but using mm -hmm. fresh air and sunshine because yeah. of the positive effects of those things. And, yeah. And um, I, I mean, people being cooped up during this, that's probably not going to help. Um, it's not, not good. I, I love that we yeah. have Zoom, you know, we're, yeah, yeah. it's creating our ability to stay connected to a degree. And there's a lot of positive yeah, yeah. things coming out of this. Yeah. I, I see people working out more than they, I think, were in the past. Hopefully yeah. we have an opportunity to carry some positive things forward out the, out the other side of this thing. Yeah. And the last thing that I, I know I've been not good about um and and uh setting a new routine is looking at the news and looking at you know looking at social media um too often you know getting fixated by this thing and yeah, letting it yeah, kind yeah. of drive me instead of the other way around i'm just yeah cutting no, that this, off take a peek at it once a day and put it away yeah 
this this is an excellent time to you know you've got time a lot of people have some people don't they're working harder than ever but uh, a lot of people have time to reflect and you know this can be a great time to decide what's important in your life and what you want to focus more on and you know make plans to you know make those changes um i just read a great book um bullet journal and wow it just you know it tells you or it it explains a very um incredible you know incredibly efficient productive way to journal um but a big part of it is learning what's really valuable to you and cutting away the stuff that's keeping you from the valuable stuff um that is so key so um yeah i mean this this is a great time to catch up on reading and and uh all kinds of stuff so anyway yeah great great point reprioritize and uh, yeah. i love that point about really cutting away the the excess the things that really aren't important the things that don't matter you know we're we're using we're, we're coming back together as a family uh, yeah. you know figuring out what our days really should look like what are the important things actually sitting yeah, around yeah. a table and having meals together and communicating yeah, yeah. and yeah and stuff sure. like that right so yeah, yeah. There's, there's positive to take away from this for sure it's it's an opportunity yeah well, hey, man, I appreciate you taking so much time out of your day. Um, oh, no problem. Yeah, I hope we get a chance to catch up again soon on the other side of this thing and we can get back to uh, feeling like life is uh, is normal and and, yeah. uh, and having some structure to the ways we approach health and, and the mindfulness and all that. Or or if not, I'll uh, if things go the other way, I may be hitting you up for some, some chicken eggs and avocados. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> all right, brother. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. Have You're a good welcome. day. Thanks. See you. Dude. All right, take care. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Dan is definitely the ultimate warrior, scholar, artist in that truest sense. And, and I think you get a, a sense for why I really wanted to rush this one out with, with everything going on right now, with all the, all the craziness. Dan is just a, a wealth of knowledge, and I'm sure you can appreciate how hard it was to hold this to, to even an hour and a half, but, but we barely scratched the surface. And he was so generous with his time to share even a, even a tiny bit of what he knows. And there's so much more there. So please hit the show notes for this at manofmastery.com slash 049 and get links to follow Dan on Instagram, follow the tips he puts out there. Keep in tune to the other ways he might start communicating here in the future, possibly reopening the website and just other products and services uh, you'll be well served by by continuing to stay in tune. And I hope that once things settle down a little bit, we can have Dan back and drive into some other topics. Or, hey, if things head the other way, then we're definitely going to need him back and learn more as much as we can learn. So what's up next? Look, as far as accelerating this one forward, so I brought it forward about a week. The next one is coming out, number 50, Milestone episode. That will be out on, I believe it's, April 16th, right? So you'll have a little bit of a lag here. Stay safe out there. Get in touch if you need anything in the meantime. If you have any questions, comments on this episode, I'd love to hear them. Go out there and rate the podcast. Go follow Dan and uh, and add some likes to his profile on Instagram. And again, just stay safe. Uh, keep it at home if you can. And just uh, keep it keep it between the rails. We'll see you back in about a week and a half, two weeks with episode 50.